there are cases where where you do need to provide that level of detail, but um, fortunately, they're they're limited to certain circumstances, right? I mean, uh, regulated medical devices, for example, in the United States and uh, Canada, uh, the Food and Drug Administration is going to require that you have that kind of auditability of your tests. Um, so, you know, if you're in that line of work, then you are going to have to go to the next step with these things and translate logical test cases into uh, concrete test cases and have that level of documentation available. Um, if you're not, then you know you need to ask yourself, well, what is the appropriate level of detail for auditability and uh, repeatability, et cetera, on our environment and come up with the right answer? Uh, might be as high level as what I showed you or even more abstract than what I just showed you or it could be more concrete but not necessarily down to the specific values and steps, et cetera. So now bringing us back to use cases, if you're creating tests based on use cases, you can see the translation of a use case um, into a logical test case is, is very easy. Um, a lot of the verbiage that was in the use case is uh, straight out, or straight replication into the test case, right? So very, very straightforward kind of process. Now, given a logical test case such as the one shown, if you do need a concrete test case, then you know, it will be a matter of just going through and refining and adding more detail, uh, adding more detail to it. But consider this carefully. Um, this is probably a topic for a subsequent, uh, subsequent webinar, I would guess, about appropriate level of detail and test cases and so forth, because this is something that uh, people find find very difficult to get their head around of how much do I need to document and you know the right answer is obviously exactly as much as you need to document and no more but that's that doesn't really answer that question and kind of throws you back into it so subsequent webinar if there's interest if some of you think that this is a topic that deserves a full 45 minutes of discussion send me an email and uh, we'll, we'll do one okay now um, what I showed you before was an informal use case. Let's move on and look at a more formal um, use case, uh, which you might you might be uh, lucky enough to receive. Um, so, in case of a formal use case, you know you've got um, additional things like an identifier. Um, you've got uh, usually a short name of the use case. People remember it. The actor will be specifically called out or actors. Um, there might be a description of the use case, what it's about, a priority. How important is this use case? This should help in a couple ways. One is it helps you do your risk analysis on the use case. Priority is going to um, a lot to do with the impact of any problems associated with the use case. And it also should be priority from point of view of um, developers building the uh, use case. So, you know, I mean, if you're in an agile kind of world and, and you're in a sprint and there's a big pile of use cases that are to be created, and one would hope that the developer would select higher priority use cases first, and then obviously that would help you test those earlier as well. Uh, and the same is true in a V model, a sequential model, that uh, we want to build the, build the more important stuff earlier if that's possible. Uh, frequency of use, another item that would be useful to have. Um, Preconditions, things which should be true before the use case starts, and conversely, post conditions, things that should be true when the uh, when the use case is, is complete. Um, often helpful to have those explicitly called out, and then we have the typical workflow and the exception workflow exactly as before. Um, so you know, obviously, this this some of this information has um, has various uses to you as a tester. Um, generating tests and of course your traceability if you will of your test cases might be a little bit finer grained if you have a, a higher level of formality. So let's take a look at um, formal use case. So here's the here's the first part uh, translating the e-commerce purchase use case that we've seen before into a formal use case. We have an ID here 2.001 we have name is e-commerce purchase. The actor in this case is the customer. Description allow customer to complete the transaction. Right, purchasing the items in the shopping cart. 
priority, of course, would be very high. Uh, frequency of use, 25% of customers. So we're, we're saying that's our you know, conversion rate, if you will. 25% of the customers come to our website and browse will buy. Uh, you know, lucky us. And uh, up to 1,000 uh, customers per day. Again, uh, lucky us. 1,000 people making a purchase a day. You're a pretty happy guy. Um, now, preconditions. Um, now, one or more items in the shopping cart, customers logged in, customers click on checkout. Now, notice that, so what I mean by being a little bit more fine-grained, notice that these were things, these preconditions were things that were happening, um, some of them were anyway, as part of the use case before, as part of the, the typical workflow. And now we're saying, no, we're actually going to break this out. We're going to have a separate browsing workflow and a separate logging in workflow conceivably, um, and then and you only get here when you've actually decided to make a purchase. So it can be a little bit more fine-grained, which would mean, of course, more use cases. Okay, typical workflow at the top. This is pretty straightforward, nothing really unusual, um, nothing surprising here, right? Almost uh, straight from the uh, previous use case. Uh, exceptions, again, pretty much straight out of uh, previous use case. And then uh, post conditions order uh, is active in the system. So that's, uh, again, what we would assume was going to be true at the end before. So not too much difference. Um, you know, somewhat more verbiage is, uh, went from, you know, one page to a two page, uh, a little bit more specificity. Uh, personally, as a tester, uh, you know, am I, if somebody gives me an informal use case, am I going to whine at them about, oh, you should have given me a formal one? No, absolutely not. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, I'm happy to get information to use as a test basis and as a test oracle, um, and you know, I'll make use of it. Uh, I'm not going to complain about, you know, um, you should be giving me formal use cases. Now, of course, if there's ambiguity in the use case, whether it's formal or informal, then that's something that you need to bring up and ask questions. And if you've gotten the use case early enough before the coding of that use case has started, there's some real value in you bringing up, pointing out the ambiguities, because that ambiguity can then be removed and uh, will result in the lower likelihood of a problem in the implementation of the use case. So, um, you know, Good to get the, the, these documents, whether formal or informal. Good, even better to get them before the coding of them starts. And uh, you know, if you're on a whether you're on a V model sequential type of waterfally sort of project, or whether you're on an agile project, um, either way, you know, you want to uh, try to get uh, get involved early, get involved early before the coding starts uh, for these, these use cases so that you can help clean them up. Okay. Um, all right. So this is a pretty uh, compact uh, webinar, comparatively speaking. Um, I've gone through um, application of um, use cases for testing of uh, typical and exceptional workflows. And this kind of um, rounds out uh, something that we looked at uh, previously, the decision tables, which uh, test the detailed business rules, and then state diagrams to test the uh, state-dependent systems. Now, if you happen to miss those webinars, then I would encourage you to go to the digital library and um, take a listen to them. They're recorded there, just as this one is.